Yeah. So, yeah. All right. So, yeah. Hi, my name is Evan Nikolaisen. I'm a PhD student at NTMU in Trondheim, Norway. And let's talk about magnetic anisotropy of natural magnetite. We're going to do that by analyzing slice and view data by using micromagnetic modeling through Merrill and then compare the results with bulk magnetic measurements. So slice and view, so slice and view for our purpose is to actually slice with a focused ion beam SEM, the micron sized volumes of silicate. And then re by removing the silicate, we can extract the actual individual magnetic particles inside. The, um, the advantage of this is that we can take the individual particles, we can then apply a um, 20 or multiple equal distributed field directions, and then calculate the magnetic hysteresis for each individual particle. And then reassembling or, or summarize all of the hysteresis parameters, then general, generalize a complete hysteresis of the overall volume. Now, such a hysteresis you can see here in red, which is comprised of 68 particles, which are oblate exolutional MLEs in OPX. And the blue curve is a single crystal measurement in a lab, uh, which is derived from the same sample. And we can see here that the experimental loop is multi-domain dominated, and our calculated loop is single domain to a single vortex uh, domination. The reason for, for this offset is what we estimate to be a regional, uh, regional difference. So when you are measuring a full or a complete uh, silicate crystal, you take everything that's included. But this is way too big for us to actually analyze. And the only regions that we can extract is what you can see here outlined in red. So therefore you get a quite a large <laughs> offset between the different hysteresis. And what we can then do is look at how much of our calculated hysteresis is actually included into the measurement. We did this by adding on multi-domain signal to the, this red curve, and then estimated uh, with a best fit uh, that about, for the Merrill calculation, actually contributes about 6% of the overall, um, uh, overall measurement. However, of this 6%, you can actually, uh, we actually calculated that this curve has about 28% of the overall magnetic remnants. We did the same thing for another um, area in Plagio Place. Here we can see that both of the loops are actually single domain dominated. So we do estimate that we actually are able in the plagiar place to capture the overall representation of the remnants of the particles that are included into it. You can see uh, the particles here are formed as uh, prolate exolutions. We have about 234 particles, uh, which, is com uh, which is combined to this red curve. However, we can also see that there is an offset. While the MR over MS is quite very equal, the uh, coercivity does have an offset. And we can see that the coercivity is higher for the actual measurement, not for our calculation. The reason for this, we estimate, is the exact opposite of what we saw in the OPX, where the, um, where the region that we can extract with slice and view is actually um, quite much smaller, but it does um, include all of the magnetic particles that would be represented. The only thing that we can question is, does this volume actually have an equal distribution of the single domain particles, which is questionable. Another um, reason for this offset could be natural features like dislocation, surface stress, and magnetic pinning, which could also have an offset for the coercivity. So we then took all of the magnetic parameters and included them into a, a specific figure. So we have OPX here for A and plagioclase for B. 
The contours uh, in the background is the orientation of the elongation axis for all of the particles. And the markers are the orientation of the different uh, ex uh, external fields, where the marker size is the cohesivity, and the marker color is the MRS over MS. Overlay is the is EBSD measurement of the crystal right next to where we actually did the milling. And everything is projected normal to a thin section surface or normal to the top uh, of the fibbed volume. What we can see in OPX is that the maximum MR over MS is parallel to the majority of the particle elongations and also parallel to the one zero, no, zero, 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 one direction of OPX. The maximum cohesivity is projected no, or is oriented normal to this. So it's parallel to the one zero zero direction. And this orthogonal relationship, just keep in mind that we are actually looking at single domain to single vortex uh, domain states, does not um, correlate with a stone wall path theory. In the plagioclase, we have a more equally distributed um, uh, remnants and cohesivity, but in general, you have a higher um, MR over MS in a plane which is defined by the primary and the secondary cluster of elongation axes. The uh, correlation is quite good with cohesivity and MRS, MR over MS, where both the maximums are oriented approximately in the same direction. We did the same thing for and try to calculate anisotropy of magnetic susceptibility. Now keep in mind that this cannot be directly correlated to initial susceptibility like you're measuring in the lab. We calculated this based on the hysteresis curve or the curvature at remnants. However, the initial state is, uh, is saturated. Um, so we need additional uh, calculations, which we are working on, to actually get more of a representation of what would be measured in the lab. However, the overall is, is quite interesting. So we have the, uh, the um, uh, zero, zero, 001 direction where the maximum uh, chi is subparallel to this. It's a little bit offset. And if we remember back to the previous uh, stereo nets, this is also offset to the elongation axis. So it's not parallel to the MR over MS. Uh, however, the minimum chi is parallel to the uh, one zero zero direction and, also, and therefore also the cohesivity. For plagioclase, you can see that it is much more equally distributed. We have an average about three, between three and five uh, SI for the susceptibility, but the maximum chi is in the zero one zero direction. So it is offset and have more of a inverse relationship uh, in regard to the MR over MS. The minimum chi is parallel to zero one, uh, one zero zero direction. Um, and this is also uh, normal to both the K1 and K2. And uh, so the conclusion remarks that we can take away from this presentation is that even though that we have magnetites which are exalted in a one zero zero, that actually contributes a very low overall percentage of an overall hysteresis loop, it actually carries a significant amount of the magnetic remnants. The cohesivity um, in like we saw in plagioclase can have a very similar uh, similar uh, overall um, correlation. However, it can suggest that we have either sampling bias, or that we have uh, dislocation, surface stress, or magnetic pinning, which we did not include into our calculations. The an orthogonal relationship between the MR over MS, like we saw in the OPX, which does not follow the, the stone Walker theory, but it does suggest that the MR over MS and the cohesivity is sensitive to either the particle shape or the domain state of the, of the particle. And the uh, magnetic susceptibility calculations um, can also show that even though that we 
have in the plagioclase a inverse relationship like we would expect for close to single domain particles, uh, we did not observe the same in the OPX, which then suggests that the magnetic anisotropy might be very sensitive to particle shape and the, uh, the particle size and the particle shape. So with uh, focus ion beam nanotomography, we can really have a powerful tool to investigate magnetic remnants uh, of natural particles. So with uh, the combination of uh, focus ion beam or slice and view, together with EBSD and, um, and micromagnetic modeling, can really start to look into the dependencies uh, or interaction between particles and also the shape and size correlation with domain state. Thank you so much for your attention and I welcome any questions you might have. Perfect, thank you very much. Um, we do have one question in the chat. Um, which says you mentioned magnetite. It was not sufficiently clear if your orthopyroxy slash plagioclase samples contained other magnetic minerals than magnetite. How would such magnetic minerals interfere with your hysteresis data and iso and anisotropy data? Yeah, so um, of course we do have uh, traces of titanium, which does su suggest that we have um, uh, ilmenite, for instance, ilmenite exolutions included into the magnetite. So it is a fair statement to, that I should say that the magnetite is not purely magnetite. In the um, uh, in the orthopyric scene, especially, uh, we can tell that we well our EBSD measurement. We don't have uh, EPMA, um, but EBSD does suggest that there is about trace um, elements of titanium. Um, and it it is fair to say that it isn't pure. Um, uh, but we don't really think that at these uh, sizes, it is really difficult to really separate uh, what is magnetite, what is ilmenite. Uh, there is also uh, a little bit of spinel uh, aluminum rich spinel, um, but the general shape uh, is what we are considering and not the, um, uh, the, uh, 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 not the actual, uh, not the, the small particles of other uh, iron oxides that could interfere, if that was answering your question. Okay, great. Um, I think Will has a question as well. Yeah, I'll jump in. I think Dave Finn has a question after me as well. Um, just very, uh, very quickly, the the time taken. You got very, very fancy, nice looking model there at the start of your uh, talk, three D model there. Uh, what sort of time investment are you looking at to generate that, and what sort of a scale can you produce in that? At the moment, I know. I mean, uh, Tobias Madsen's done similar stuff as well, but I'm thinking about trying to scale that up then to kind of more applied sort of study. Um, yeah, roughly speaking, what kind of size space are you analyzing there, and what sort of time would you need per whatever cubic millimeter? Yeah. So, so the um, the model that I showed on the second slide that's about ten by ten by ten microns. Uh, we have experience, or we have tried to uh, to extract larger volumes than that. Uh, we have some volumes which are upwards of thirty microns in length. Uh, however, we cannot really get the same depth uh, with a thirty by ten by seven, which is the one that we have from from the orthopyroxene that I presented. Uh, that took about 35 hours uh, to mill. It's uh, with about, I think it is 25 uh, nanometer slice thickness. Um, and of course you can increase the beam uh, current to, to also increase the volume that you extract, but um, we try to keep it between 10 
to uh, to 20 um, microns in size in general for all the access. Um, that is the limit of the booking that I had for the instrument. Um, and also when we try to extract larger volumes than that, then the uh, failure rate skyrocketed. The, the machine just w weren't able to handle the uh, beam drift and the beam current uh, that I had to uh, apply. Cool. All right, thanks very much. Mm. Um, we just have one last question in the chat, um, which is, have you ever seen something that does follow the sonar wolf Earth predictions? Yeah, so in in the ortho, no in the plagioclase, um, the elongated um, or the the uh, prolate particles does actually suggest a sonar wolf off uh, correlation uh, with the coercivity and the remnants um, oriented in the same direction uh, or the same crystallographic direction. So it's it's a bit. Um, like since we only have one volume for now, it is quite difficult to be very consistent and try to make a, a uh, statement out of it. But it does suggest that the particle shape is more a uh, is more of a defining factor uh, toward if you actually have a uh, correlation with Stonewall path and then for single domain particles. Uh, once you start to get more prolate, no, uh, oblate particles, then weird stuff starts to happen and we start to deviate from that theory. Mm. 